Hello, everybody. This is James the Ball on the Scoverton, dedicated to original peoples, as always. And we've got a special guest on. He's been on before. We had to get him on again at part two. Professor Stephen Smalls, how are you doing, my brother? Good to have you back. Good. Thanks, James. It's good to be back. I was glad to do the first presentation. I hope that people found it interesting and relevant. I know that you cover a lot of topics over a, a, a number of years. So, you know, thanks for the invitation. And I look forward to some of the questions. We've had some great feedback off our last one anyway. And I said, well, we only happened to get 35 minutes last time. I'm going to try to make it a bit longer because a person like yourself definitely needs more time. Okay. Uh, I always appreciate. So anyway, we're going to more focus on um, <clears throat> the transatlantic slave trade. Yeah. At, at whatever point in time, but we'll go from the earliest times. But also another thing that we always want to cover as well, which I don't hear too much about, is the trans Saharan slave trade. This yeah. is the, uh, the Arab slave trade, you know, um, and also times with the Ottomans and other peoples and that. But from your, your earliest knowledge of the slave trade, um, obviously we knew about the slave. I know you knew about it before you went into any academia world. You know, no. we sure knew that. But when we get deeper into it, when you start studying it properly, what, what was the earliest things that you find to lead to these atrocities of the transatlantic slave trade? Okay. <clears throat> well, the, the first thing to say is that growing up in Liverpool as a teenager, going to school and watching TV and listening to politicians, they never told us anything that was important or relevant about the slave trade or slavery. All they did was celebrate abolition. They never told us about the ways in which Britain and Liverpool in particular, was involved in the slave trade, was central to the slave trade, benefited economically and politically from the slave trade. They never told us anything about that. All they told us is that slavery was a good thing, that the British and Europeans brought Christianity and culture to Africa. They told us that Africans were savage, were barbarians, that they were cannibals, all this kinds of, of, of nonsense. That really was colonizing our mind, messing our minds up, uh, you know, when we were young and growing up. So that's the first thing. It was all a, a gross misrepresentation to celebrate the British Empire and to celebrate Liverpool's so-called achievements. These were achievements for white people, elites or in general, and they were not achievements for black people. Okay. However, we so the first things that we heard, that I heard, was, was this kind of nonsense, propaganda, misrepresentation, distortion. Fortunately, there were black people in the community who I call the black elders who challenged this. People like Mr. Joey Joel Sr., people like Sandra Antigua, people like Bobby Nayo, people like Angus Chukamaka, people like Wally Brown and Carly Montoot and others who told us, look, don't listen to this nonsense. These are lies. These are misrepresentations. The slave trade was not brought about, did not begin for the benefits of black people. It did not begin for the benefit of Africans. It began to benefit and make uh, Britain and Europe rich. So it got us questioning because the nonsense we got from schools gave rise to a lot of self-doubt about who we are as black people and issues of dignity and respect. So that, that, that's the first thing. Then the second thing that happened is, the way I describe it is, when I was a teenager, I was fortunate that reggae music and Rastafari arrived in Britain and in Liverpool. And what reggae music and Rastafari did is they spoke about the slave trade. But, it, but what reggae shared with us was almost diametrically opposed to the nonsense and the racism that we got in schools and media and TV. And what reggae and Rastafari did is it told us about rebellions, how enslaved people resisted slavery, how they organized rebellions. It gave us names of people like Sam Sharp and Nanny of the Maroons who rebelled against slavery. It gave us names of people like Paul Bogle after slavery and then people like Marcus Garvey. So the way I describe it is listening to 10 reggae records was met with more knowledge and information and insight than 20 years growing up in Britain, in Liverpool, listening to nonsense in, in schools, okay? 
reggae music also gave us names of people to read and encourages us to go and read material and find out more, not only about the slave trade, but about Africa before slavery. Because as you know, James, from your knowledge and experience, our lives did not begin, Africans did not begin with slavery. They began in uh, millennia of civilizations and history. So it broadened you know, our, our, our experience, it broadened our knowledge and led us to reading. Okay, In terms of the, the, the horrors of the slave trade, what I would say is this. <clears throat> I went to university and initially the stuff that I read was similar uh, praising British achievements, discussing how Britain beat the French in terms of profits. And, and of course, the British favorite, which is abolition, abolition, abolition. That's all they want to talk about. They don't talk about hundreds of years of exploitation, hundreds of years of exploitation before. Anyway, the point is this. After hearing all of that all my life, I then came across a book by Walter Rodney, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And this, to me, was a revolutionary book that challenged the entire basis of British education, British knowledge, everything that politicians had told us. And one of the most important things I remember about that book is there's a sentence in the book where Walter Rodney says, when does an African become a slave? And then he says, first, an African becomes a captive. But because the Europeans killed so many people during the so-called Middle Passage, many Africans didn't become slaves. Okay, so his point is Europeans didn't go to Africa and get slaves. They went to Africa and they captured Africans, but ne many of them were never, uh, never became slaves, what we now call enslaved. So this was a major conceptual difference and major issue in terms of humanizing uh, black people. Okay, um, at, at university and beyond, you know, I, I studied the slave trade. I wanted to know what was going on, how many people were involved, what kind of brutalities happened to men and women. Okay, yeah, And I've been studying that for many decades, and, and I see it as a horrific experience that was designed to enrich Europeans and to degrade, to dominate, to exploit, and to subordinate Africans. The last thing I want to say right now is... Uh, at present, I've come to the conclusion, and I'm convinced of this, that we've spent too much time looking at the U.S. The U.S. is very important in terms of the slave trade, but it's not the only area. It's not the most important area, and it's not representative. So what I've been arguing for the last five, ten years is that we need to continue looking at the U.S., but we need to go beyond the U.S.A., Particularly, we need to look at the, the West Indies, at the Caribbean, as we call it, and we need to look at Brazil. Let me give you an example why. The U.S., according to the information we have, and it's not entirely accurate, but it's the best we have, around half a million Africans were captured and loaded and transported to the United States. But several million Africans were transported to Brazil. So far more Africans were enslaved in Brazil than in the U.S., so Brazil is central and important. important. A second issue is hundreds of thousands of Africans had been transported, captured, and put in Brazil before the United States even existed. The United States didn't exist until the 1770s. So if we look at Brazil, we see that the slave trade lasted much longer. We see that the Portuguese were involved much earlier than the Spanish and the British. We also, by looking at Brazil, see that there were massive rebellions of enslaved people before the United States even existed. So what I'm saying is the United States is important. Well, increasingly, I think if we want to better understand the slave trade, we want to better understand resistance, resilience, rebellion. We need to spend more time looking at Brazil and more time looking at the West Indies. It's funny you mentioned about uh, Brazil as well. Um, I'm looking at like a bit of history, early Muslims in Brazil. Early, early, was it the times with uh, the Portuguese? Where, like, that was actually quite interesting. Like, I wasn't actually aware of the uh, Muslim presence, but obviously, I've looked more into it now at the yeah. time. Now, in um, other parts of Latin America, whether it's Colombia, Venezuela, Cuba, mm -hmm. well, Cuba, Latin America as well, and I mean, then Argentina, wow, 
you know, from the history, the racism that, that's gone on down in Argentina, a lot of the, the black people happen to lead the place and stuff and Mm-hmm. And then other places, yeah, there's, there's a lot of like, there's quite a bit of races, like, um, I don't know, but you, I'm sure you've experienced yourself, like, um, you are talking about last time where that colorism kind of mulatto, but it's like almost yeah. like mulatto, 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 like it's mm-hmm. um, almost like a caste system to a degree, not like India, but like it's almost like oh, yeah. different caste. How do you find like um, Latin America as a whole though? Um, mm-hmm. I know Brazil's the largest in places, African descendants, but other places as well, like Argentina one time, but, you know, the history of the, with Africans. Yeah. Well, look, again, the first thing to say is that the British educational system didn't give us information about these other places. Britain is so obsessed with, with its navel gazing, with looking at its own experience and celebrating falsely its own experience that we don't learn. So when I arrived in the US in the 1980s, even here, we didn't pay much attention to anywhere outside the English zone. The US is preoccupied with itself. But more and more, I met Brazilians. More and more, I went to Brazil. I've been to Brazil at least 15 times. Several times I went for months. I studied Portuguese. So the first thing to say is that it's a very complicated system. You know, there were far more black people, far more Africans in Brazil. And they had a different system of exploitation across the whole of the Americas from the US to Argentina. Argentina, They manipulated racial categories. They turned dark-skinned people against so-called light-skinned people. Yeah. This was part of a strategy literally to divide and rule. So yeah. what you find in Brazil is far more what they call mulattoes. I don't like the word. Far more that. people who were light-skinned, who were legally free and who worked against black people. Not all of them, but many of them. So when you go to Brazil, the first thing they say is, we are not racist, it's the US which is racist. So this is a distraction, it's a misrepresentation, and it's simply not true. So when you look at Brazil, you find a different system of exploitation in which they incorporated people who are lighter skinned or people who had white fathers to divide and rule. So that's the first thing. The second thing, as you say, it wasn't just Brazil. There was slavery in Venezuela. There was slavery in Colombia. There was slavery in Argentina. And these are the areas. And we're only beginning to learn more about that. In the past, when I was at university, we could ignore it. Now we can't ignore it anymore. There are more and more books. There's more and more information. And really, we need we need to spend a lot more time studying it. Argentina is rep- represents itself as if they didn't have slavery. When you go to Argentina... The people there, the white people, they say, look, there's no blackness here. There's no black people here. You need to go to Brazil. Again, it's a lie. It's a misrepresentation. I don't know whether they are victims of Argentinian education or whether they don't want to feel guilty. You know, we have all these psychological issues going on. But Argentina was absolutely central to slavery. So was Colombia. After Brazil, there are more black people in Colombia than anywhere else in South America. So, again, my point is, these are important areas we need to look at, okay? That will enable us to compare what happened with the United States. One other thing, you mentioned Muslims. Here's what I say with regard to Muslims and the slave trade. It's become very clear that a very large proportion of the Africans captured in West Africa, South Central Africa, and so on, many of them were Muslim. Many of them were, were, were grown up as Muslims and had grown up with Islam. But this wasn't described. It's not described in the British books on slavery. And we're finding out more and more, particularly in Brazil, that the rebellions of enslaved people were led by Muslims. And I feel ignorant on this issue. I think it's something that more and more young people will find out about as things have opened up. We know, for example, I grew up learning that Many of the rebellions in Jamaica, in Guyana, and elsewhere were led by Africans born in Africa who were then transformed. Not all of them, but many of them. Well, many of those Africans were Muslim. So again, what we need there is is a broader understanding that British education doesn't give us, that US education doesn't give us. But now we have more and more scholars who are writing about these issues, and we'll find out more about them as we go forward. 
Yeah, I mean, like it's it's one thing. Like um, I was, I was like, I actually started looking at the slave trade like quite early. But when I, I was a, I turned a Muslim when I was about thirteen, twelve, something like that. Mm. Not for long. And what I noticed is, from my own personal experience, was at this time, it wasn't like it. It was like I went. Ex- I felt like not accepted. <laughs> when is it not accepted? Like. The Arabs out there think, you know, they look at them totally different. It doesn't matter if you're the Muslim, you know. So so I started looking into the Arab slave trade. And I, when I seen the numbers, I couldn't believe the numbers, you know. But at the same time, there's different periods of time. So if we're talking from, like, the earliest period, like, say, from the time when Islam was expanding and it's coming mm-hmm. into North Africa, I'm aware that... Um, there wasn't a whole lot of slaves at that time. It was like maybe he agreed to 300 a year when they were coming into Nubia. And then they wanted about, they wanted so many slaves a year or something like that. But it wasn't a huge numbers until the Ottomans, is it the Mamluks? You sound them? Is, is your sound Sorry, I just, I just got distracted then, James. I, I heard you <coughs> talking about the early period Muslims. Yeah, so and then you, you asked yeah, me a question. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So that early period, yeah. And okay, so many slaves were taken. But I'm talking about when the you know the Mamluks, the time of them um them becoming the masters, yeah. and then they took over. But then I'm not sure exactly with the where where the Arabs are always still there though, weren't they? Yeah. In well, look- involved, those involved, basically what I mean. Okay. Well, look, let me respond in this way. I, I don't have a lot of information yeah. about the so-called Arab slave trade. You, you've read more. This is an area that I need to look at. And this is an area that anyone who's interested in slavery, I think they need to look at it, you know, far more than I've done. Okay. But I'll say a few things. First, first of all, we know that there was a significant slave trade across the Sahara and across, you know, what we now call the Cape, uh, sorry, the, the Horn of Africa. Okay, yeah. and you know that's raised in a number of ways. So I can't talk in detail about that, but I think it's important as a topic. But I'll say a couple yeah. of other things. People sometimes say, "Why are you looking at the enslavement of Black Africans? What about the Arabs? What about them too?" And the first thing I say is, "Look, there was slavery in a lot of different places." Okay, however, the enslavement of Africans in what became America and what became South America is far more important with regard to the existence of European societies, with regard to the profits that European societies made, with regard to how many black people there are in Europe and in the US. It's far more important in terms of its legacy than the so-called Muslim slave trade. I'm not saying the Muslim slave trade Mm -hmm. is irrelevant. I'm saying it's just not relevant in Europe and the American in the same way as the enslavement of Africans. Yeah. The second thing I'll say is that we do need to look at the slave trade across the Sahara. But many times what I find, it's just meant as a distraction to prevent us looking at the enslavement of Africans. They say, why are you looking at this? You should look at this. And my response is, no, you should look at that. <laughs> I'm looking at what I think is important and what's relevant to my life and my community. And I'm not going to look at these other issues unless I find them useful, which, as I've said, I do. Yeah. So I reject the idea that it's a distraction. It's important in itself, but we have to be concerned with the motives of some people. Clearly not you. You're there to broaden your mind and yeah. broaden your knowledge and that of the community. And I agree with that. The final thing is, in the last 10 or 15 years, people have started talking about slavery everywhere, in every country, in every place, including modern slavery. And I've been at conferences where people have said, Why are you looking at slavery in the past? What about modern slavery? It's more important. And again, I'm suspicious of their motives because modern slavery, I understand there's trafficking. I understand there's abuse. But again, I think with some people, it's a way of of, of preventing us from looking at the enslavement of Africans. And it's a way of preventing us from looking at the legacies. So what they say is don't look at the past, look at the present. So, uh, you know, I raise these issues for people to think about them. But obviously, I encourage people, as you do, to explore these different areas to see how it broadens our mind. 
and broadens our understanding. So I think, you know, clearly uh, there's a lot of uh, hostility and hatred towards Muslims, and we challenge that. But what we've also seen is there's far more people like yourself, like others, who have studied Islam and have seen there's more to it than, than the misrepresentations that we get uh, yeah, in the media. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I've kind of found myself is there, and I've, seen, I've found that there's the difference between Islam and Arabism. The, you know, oh. Yeah, this once I found out this, this is where I was more looking at it from a fair the point of view, mm -hmm. like um, <clears throat> understand, like respecting the brotherhood of it, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the same time, when it's used politically, this is where it works with any religion, when it's used politically rather than spiritually, you know, um, to gain power. So when I was looking at Mauritania, 1980, mm -hmm. 1980 slavery being legalized at that time, and it seems like this Arab slave trade, it seemed like it went on even longer. And obviously it started obviously early as well. Um, also, like for example, um, when we align ourselves with different groups, and sometimes it can be difficult because sometimes we can analyze what well, we all have one common enemy. Mm -hmm. but at the same time, sometimes we look and we have one common enemy. What I found is we can figure out who the arch enemy is, <laughs> the, mm -hmm. uh, being the arch enemy, but they still see the other enemies who are like um, doing the same thing, but like they don't have the power as mm -hmm. the European, but they're kind of doing the same thing. Like um, if you look at uh, how they treat in North Africa, how they treat the Africans there, Africans go yeah, to yeah, oh, yeah. They're going to Libya, and they're just treating them absolutely terrible. All these, yeah, yeah. And, and the Middle East, the, you know, whatever. You know. Yeah. And it seems like they can get away with treating us this bad because the European. But at the same time, there's it's it's not even just the European because you can go back before, you can go to the Roman period, you can go to different yeah. periods of time, yeah. you know. So. History throughout, it always seems like everybody's had the eye on Africa for a very, very long time, you know. Mm -hmm. So whether it doesn't matter with this group, this group, this, it just seems like they were all there and they were all there to benefit. And yeah, to learned, exploit. And how much they learned, what benefited them as well, exploit. But they also exploited the knowledge and used that knowledge against us yeah. and created a bunch of different religions, you know, that were created from things. And then it seemed like... They, the selling us back the watered down version of something that we originally had, but we had something in a pure version, you know, it wasn't mm -hmm. actually more spiritual, how we can put yes. it. So um <clears throat> that's why that's what that's what like you said, I mean you made some good points before. It, it's important to look into these things, but at the same time, don't let it be a distraction. Yeah. I'm totally yeah. totally for that because at the same time, I don't mind speaking, and we're speaking to our, our own people about these things. So we yeah. should speak on, explore these topics. I'll even sometimes speak, me and Terence, your nephew, we're having discussions yeah. on. I what, know, yeah. Whatever happened to the black people in ancient China and the amount of research I've, I've looked into it from the earliest times to even some of the slaves even been sent there by the Arabs yeah. during the Tang Dynasty, mm -hmm. sixth century times. So yeah. when I'm looking at all this and then later on, I'm looking at pictures in China from about 100 years, 120 years ago, the time when the Europeans were going in there. Mm -hmm. And I was noticed that a lot of the pictures that they took were very different looking Chinese people. They were very dark skinned. So it yeah. seems like from that period of time, whether it was from the Qin Dynasty, the late 1800s, down to Chairman Mao, it seems like he just disappeared. Mm -hmm. Now, the only problem I have with this, things do happen and it's different places, but... When things are just a mystery, like people just disappear with no answer, so, that's yeah. what winds me up more. And it makes me want to get deeper into the study because yeah. when I see something is so hidden, like you're the peens are hiding stuff all the time, but you will get odd you're the peens who will come out and give you this knowledge, <laughs> not give you the body yeah. of people about what they found. Make it available. Yeah. But we don't seem to find that with other groups. Mm hmm you know, so well, that's what's problem. You, you raise a lot of important things there, and I hope that people watching will think about those things and, and take action. Okay. Yeah. The first thing, let me say this, let me use a cliche. Things are not black and white. 
You yeah. talk about the arch enemy, but there's more to it than meets the eye. That's another cliche. Yeah. So what we see is that, yeah, there was a dominant European slave trade, but there are other kinds of antagonisms. There's other kinds of tensions. There's other kinds of competition, you know, yeah. going on, other kinds of, of warfare. So what we have to do is we have to be alert to, to you know, the complications of what's going on. Okay. Yeah. You know, we've heard, for example, that during slavery, some of the uh, enslaved people that escaped then became slave catchers. Okay. And this, you know, it gets us confused because we're expecting yeah. some kind of solidarity, but things are not as simple as they seem. So that's the first thing. So be ready for these kinds of complexities. Um, the second thing I would say, and I think you've made it very clear, is don't trust British education on its own. Yeah. Don't trust British media and British politicians. You know, in Liverpool, for example, the politicians and the people with power have spoken about racial harmony, saying there's always racial harmony. Eric Heffer, who was the MP, used to say, don't come to Liverpool, we've got racial harmony. What I have found out is every one of them that said there was racial harmony, they had no evidence. Yeah. But when we documented racial discrimination, they just dismissed. So you can't believe what they tell us. OK, you have to look behind. You have to self-educate. You have to get knowledge. You have to look and speak to people in the community and speak to elders. So what you're doing and what I've been doing alongside my formal education is reading things that they tell us not to read, you know, like Eric Williams and Amy Cezaire and Amy Jakes Garvey, that kind of thing. OK, and then the, 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 the final thing I'd say, and I'm curious about yourself, is uh, we have to create our own knowledge. We have to do our own writing. We have to organize programs like this to share these insights to people and, you know, and do our own knowledge. And it doesn't have to be, you know, books going through university press and all that, because, you know, they police what we're going to write and they, you know, constrain us and resist us and that kind of thing. But we can produce articles. We can produce blogs. We can produce social media and, you know, shows like this, interviews like this, I think are central. Uh, to give people an opportunity to think beyond formal education. And yeah. I really encourage people to do their own work. Let me take this chance to, to mention a few things recent. So uh, one of the problems in Britain, I find, is that there's too much focus on Black London. That mm -hmm. whenever people talk about Black Britain, people in the US, people in Britain, they talk about Black London as if Black London represents Black Britain. And Black London does not represent Black Britain. Black London is not even indicative of Black Britain. And it certainly doesn't represent Liverpool. As you know, Black people were here hundreds of years before the Windrush. So what we found in recent times and what's happening more and more is we're producing more and more knowledge about Black Liverpool. So you may have heard about Wally Brown's biography that was published earlier this year. It's a fantastic biography. He's not an academic. He tells his story about his life and his mother and father growing up, the racism they faced and, and so on and so, uh, and he documents these experiences in a very readable way. This is important that we document our lives. Jimmy Jagney and I have recently published a book called 1981, Black Liverpool, Past and Present, where we document key issues from the point of view of black people who challenged what Liverpool uh, has to say. So this kind of information is being published. One other thing I want to say is, I haven't been able to find a single book about the history of black women or about a black woman in, in Liverpool. Ray Costello published a book in 2007 called Black Pioneers, and he has profiles of several important black women. OK, and that's it. That, you know, that's very useful. But I still haven't found the book. Apparently, there's a book about a woman who, you know, who grew up in Liverpool in the 30s and 40s. Yeah, I think Lillian Bader. I haven't been able to find that book. Uh, but uh, there is a lot of information available about Dorothy Kuya. Uh, we have an archive of Dorothy Kuya. Uh, Jenea Pickett, who is a local black woman, is the, the head of that archive, working with WOW and with the museums. So we're going to produce more and more information because the point I'm making is clearly slavery has been misrepresented in schools, but yeah. also black Liverpool has been misrepresented. Uh, yeah. We need to, to write our own history and to write more and more of our own history if we're really going to challenge that and make that available. Yeah, I mean, like I say, from looking at it from a global, a global um, 
representation of black history. Mm. And you've got places there that it's they're struggling to find the history really bad. Yeah. yeah. Really bad. It seems like some part of South America, possibly. Yeah. yeah. Parts of Europe, James. Parts you know, Europe. I go to the oh, Netherlands, yeah, I go to Spain, yeah. I go to Portugal. You know, yeah. in Portugal, they're still talking about discovering America. Wow. They have a monument in Lisbon called the Monument to the Discoveries. And it's all men. There's, you know, like 30 men and one woman. And they're talking about, we discovered America. We discovered, we brought Christianity. We brought... In Spain, they have a day in October, which in English is called the Day of Spanishness. And they celebrate the discovery of South America. So as bad as things are in Britain, you know, there's a lot of other places. And what we find is more and more there's interaction between black people in these different countries. Yeah. And, you know, moving forward, for example, I met a black woman who wrote her PhD on black people in Spain. And I said, what's the main argument in your PhD? I can get that. But what's it? And you know what she said? She said, the main argument is as soon as black people in Spain get citizenship, they leave because there's nothing for them in Spain. I'm not saying Spain is the worst, but it's definitely not the best. I don't know that anywhere is best. You know, yeah. it's all a struggle. But as you said, some places are struggling more. And I believe yeah, really so. because of black people's protest, because of black people's mobilization, because we've refused to be what they want us to be, as Bob mm -hmm. Martin would say, we've been able to produce more literature in the UK. Not as much as we deserve, but yeah. more than anywhere else in Europe. And that's why I'm, I'm involved in discussions and, and, and take part in conferences, seminars, meetings with black people and other nations in Europe. Uh, so that we can, you know, help one another uh, to, to to get better knowledge. And uh, as you know, knowledge is important. But again, I assume you you agree. Knowledge is the first step for social change. We're getting knowledge for itself, but it's also a matter of challenging this idea that the British Empire was some kind of wonderful, beneficial uh, enterprise. It absolutely was not. And we need to question this in order to to move forward with, with social change. Yeah, because you have some people who have the attitude of just because you're born here, it means that you shouldn't look, look at anywhere else. Just look at the ah. empire. That's just so small. And, and it, yeah, it narrow mindedness. It wouldn't make sense, like to just look at it from the, the start of the British Empire, or you know, because that's giving people like extra credit that you did this. That's and, right. You know, so. I think, um, just, but this seems like a big problem all over the world. Also, going into visit indigenous peoples in rainforest, I've had to go into the Philippines, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, these places. And these people are like hidden peoples. Like when I say hidden, yeah, yeah. first of all, I mean, I was like looking at Dr. Renok Rashidi. He's the first person who I, I didn't actually have a clue that they were indigenous people still there as black people. So when I actually got to meet Renoco and um, brought him to Liverpool, done an event for them, also mm -hmm. got a Zoom with them. So we connected anyway, and I was speaking to him about um, a lot of these groups. We spoke speaking on our experiences. There's actually a Zoom on, on one of my channels where we spoke okay. speaking on our experiences of, and the very similar experiences as black people where we were asking each other, what did you get when you met them? But we found that like when you meet the ones in Southeast Asia, the ones, the more darker ones. It's more of a connection. But then when I went to Vietnam in the North, because mm -hmm. they're no longer as black people did, they declined just like they have in China. But mm -hmm. a lot of American soldiers during the Vietnam War, oh, yeah. Yeah. they witnessed, I witnessed accounts of these black people in these rainforests and jungles. Oh. And so. Mm -hmm. so that's what made it even more interesting where it's what it, it's whatever's available for people, or I mean, what's put put to people. But you've got to go and look for stuff, and that yeah. Because if you two, you don't start looking for stuff, you'll never know what who and who and what is. You know. Well, you don't know what's true and what's not true. Yeah. That, you know, you have to use your own judgment, right? Ultimately, you have to use. Yeah. Let's go. You know, my dad used to say all the time. You know, use your common sense. You know, totally. which you know it might sound simple, but it's a matter of questioning what you find out, and again. What you're saying to me, what I understand is, look, things are far more complicated. There's far more hidden histories than we know. Wow, yeah. And we need to look at them now again. It could become overwhelming. So my view is you've got to have an eye to the big picture. Look beyond the obvious. 
but also keep a sense of priority. Yeah. And each of us will make our priorities. The priority for me is uh, bringing black people to the center of the analysis, bringing black people to the center of the details and the description. And more important, I'm using this, this phrase, I want to hear more and more black voices about what happened, what happened during slavery, what happened during imperialism, what happened during Windrush, what's happening right now. And not all black voices are radical or progressive. We've seen yeah. there are some blacks who are, who are uh, reactionary and right wing. So it's not all black voices. That's just one issue. But progressive black voices, you know, pan-African voices right. yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that can get us thinking. So again, it's a matter of keeping a sense of proportion. You know, I've been a professor for decades and decades, and I'm still finding things that are new. Just hearing from you some of these experiences in Vietnam yeah. and in Southeast Asia. I mean, I've barely heard of them. So yeah. again, I, you know, I try to read broadly, but also keep a sense of priority. We're going to run out, so let's 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 We're going to, um, come back to it again. Part two. We'll come back yeah, to part and, two. and spend a few more minutes. Black Yenis. Oh, here you go. Here you go. Okay. okay, so we're back. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. We're back again anyway. And, um, okay, so we're back. Let me finish up sort of like what we were saying before. Um, we were speaking on like the, the diaspora. Well, I've been called diaspora. It'd be the original diaspora of whether it's indigenous Af indigenous peoples around the world, melanated yeah. peoples. And it seems that there's mm -hmm. a, like a black genocide basically on... Black people, melanated people, wherever we are in this world. I mean, looking at yeah. Australia, looking at how they were living, Pacific Islanders, looking at the Spanish invasions, the mm -hmm. Portuguese invasions. So we yeah. did just see, like, because when you, like we were saying before, about only focusing on the British Empire. So that means you're going to leave out all when the the Portuguese, the Spanish were going out to explore mm -hmm. and um, because they, if it weren't for them, they wouldn't even known after. Of, are half of the roots, and obviously they, the Portuguese, they've learnt off the Moors, and you know, yeah, the, yeah. the credit goes on if you if you trace it back. Yeah, you just got to look back. It's a, it's a matter of where you decide to start. So what you know, the lesson I take from what you're saying, James, is look, there was a lot more migration before the slave trade. Definitely, there was a lot more migration. There was a lot more conflict and exploitation before the European slave trade. You know. I work with my friend and colleague Kwame Namako in Netherlands. He has a program called the Black Europe Summer School. It's a two-week program that focuses on black people in Europe as citizens facing racism rather than immigrants because Europe, they're always obsessed with black people as immigrants, but yeah. we've been citizens forever. Anyway, what he says is, listen, if you look at 500 years of colonialism, how do you explain the exploitation and conflict against Africans before colonialism. Because if European yeah. colonialism began in the 1400s, yeah. clearly there was a lot of exploitation before. So he says, look, you've got to have a longer period and you've got to look at more. Now, some people find that a challenge because it's a challenge to look at 500 years. Yeah. So what I say to people is, look, find somewhere to begin. Take some action. Don't just accept what people are telling us. Don't just accept what's written in or what you hear in schools. You know, my father always challenged it. My father, I'm sure he, he didn't he didn't go to school beyond the age of 14 or 15. He was a barber. But he said, look, you don't accept these things. You're looking to, So I say to people, begin where you can. Ask the questions that you can. Talk to other people. You know, clearly shows like this are, are very useful, you know, where you're, you're alerting people getting them to activate their mind and their critical thought. Yeah. And don't become overwhelmed. You know, if you find looking at 5,000 years is too much, begin somewhere, start somewhere and, and keep going. You yeah, know? that's right. Um, Definitely. And that's how you get ahead. That's how you get ahead. Yeah, yeah I mean, because when I started, like, realizing, like, I mean, I, I started looking at the, a while ago, the Af Out of Africa diaspora, like read yeah. the original one, first of humanity. Um, yeah. getting interesting when I first seen it and then when I started exploring different places in the world and, and I'd see well the reason why you can see all these people still melanated in these particular yeah. places even though they won't tell you about half the people you've got a lot of places that will tell you we have no indigenous people here Indonesia will say stuff like that and yeah, yeah. sometimes you get other Southeast Asian like 
my journey when I went into Malaysia, for example, mm-hmm. I had to find these peoples when I went there, and I had no help off local people and nothing like that. No one had known, most people had no knowledge of these people mm-hmm. lived there, and they are the indigenous peoples. So I ended up having to look, I was just searching, searching, then luckily I bumped into someone who overheard the conversation and I said, I know how to find these and put me onto somewhere where I had to go. A yeah. little bit of a drive and <laughs> to find the place that to even organise even how to get up there, get picked up at six in the morning, get down there and just seeing the people and it's just seeing them in, in, and, and how they live and, that, and yeah. just look like African people, just like... You wouldn't. You wouldn't. You could put them anywhere in the world. They're just a little yeah. shorter. Um, but these most people you find in these rainforests are all quite short people. And uh, yeah. we could go deep into the pygmies of Congo. Or how there's a connection going way back. Yeah, yeah. But it's 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 really deep with research, like you're saying. Sometimes people struggle with five hundred trying to get it accurate, and then you can go back and back. Yeah. You know. But basically, with my point would be is uh, like you've even just said yourself. There's many. Africans navigating, exploring outside of Africa, whether it was trade yeah. with China, India, Europe, yeah. doesn't matter where it was, with the world, basically. Yeah. And I think that this is very important on the global African presence. And yes, the diaspora is so important, but pre-slavery, all the yeah. achievements, because yeah. when we just got, you know, when we I remember the talking about is the Greeks, the fathers of civilization, the Romans, yeah. It was all the romanticizing history, even though after that they were there and making it, you were making up, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, or like, yeah, so there's and faults. But at the end of the day, we 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 can see most in the place of people like Herodotus, Homer, you know, where um, Socrates or all these different people, you can see the le- the lesson he learned of African people. Sure. Know? So again, goes on, and still to this day, they're still yeah. learning of us, <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's, uh, Continuous thing. They're continuing to praise people who have many faults yeah. and many inaccuracies and who made many guesses that were not based on, on facts. I mean, someone as wicked and brutal as Winston Churchill, they're still defending him and saying we're not supposed to look at the full Winston Churchill. They're ready to send hundreds of police officers to prevent a statue yeah. being addressed. Okay, yeah. so this is what we're up against. But, you know, the lesson I get from what you just said, James, is, you know, people say to me, Stephen, what kind of hope do we have? We don't have the resources. We don't have the... I said, look, we may not have those resources, but what we have is we have determination yeah. and we have perseverance and we have resistance and we don't give up. And that's the message I just got from you when you said you went and you found it difficult, but you keep pushing ahead. Keep pushing. You keep pushing ahead. You know, you're going to hit some obstacles. Don't expect it to be easy. You're not going to just give it up like that. So it's it's important to recognize that and, and to, you know, build on some of the things that we've we've already achieved. You know, let me give you an example of, you know, when I, I study a lot of these heritage sites, uh, that you that are based uh, in the south in Virginia and Georgia and Louisiana. Okay, mm-hmm. and when you go to the sites owned and managed by whites, they begin southern history with black people as slaves. They don't tell you about Africa, but when yeah. you go to the smaller sites, the African American River Road Museum in Louisiana or the Richmond Tour in Richmond, Virginia, they begin in Africa, and they say, "Look, let's begin the story where it should begin." In Africa, what happened? Mm. And they talk about the slave trade. See, the main sites won't talk about the slave trade because it's nothing but brutality. They like to talk about plantations and they make up these stories about um, um, so-called, what's the Uh, phrase? So-called kind slave masters. I've never heard such nonsense in my life. Kind and beneficial slave masters. It it makes no sense, but these are the kind of myths that they talk. So, you know, you got to ask, ask yourself, ask yourself, where does the story begin? And the story begins in Africa. And Europeans don't like it. But we're all African. The origin of life is in Africa. And we're all African, but they don't want the story to begin there. They like the story to begin in Greece. Yeah. And it's and it's a whitewash story. You know, and like we, you said we, before, we challenge it. Like you said before about the focus only on America as well. Yeah. Was, you know, um, as, as far as understanding 
people brought over from Africa. And what's interesting with that is, is like, during the times of, um, um, say, before Malcolm X, even the times, yeah. you have the Nation of Islam, and a lot of people being able to join, and at the same time, great having Black Liberation Movement, but at the same time, the names that they want to gravitate towards was more to Arabic names. So mm-hmm. they use your slave master name, mm-hmm. the European, but then take on the Arabic names rather than yeah. all the African names. But at the same time, it's what's available to people, which I'm definitely aware of. Maybe it was only certain people like Doc, you know, the, not everyone was like Dr. John Hendrick Clark or or, or, or uh, Carter Woodson, Carter yeah. G. Woodson. Yeah. Not everyone was like that, so no, no. It's interesting, but where we are today, yeah. you know, um, yes, there's people gravitating a bit more to Africa, better than how it was at one time. Absolutely, it needs to be. It needs to be a bit more, more. You know, we need to speed it up. We need to speed it up. We need to speed it up. That's the way. Yeah, yeah. Hey, look. Yeah. We're doing what we can, as you know, people yeah. are, you know, there's, there's economic challenges and political challenges. So people are doing what we can. And I think, you know, it's going to take a long time and people are going to make mistakes, but we keep encouraging them. You know, that that's what I say. You know, we yeah. work with people to encourage them rather than to blame them. OK, and we get frustrated. I get frustrated. You know, I've been working on this now for decades as as yourself. So, you know, yeah. I'm always looking for motivation, looking to find people who have the interest, looking to encourage people. And, yeah. you know, and, and we do it in, in, in that way. And as you say, you know, uh, people look for, you know, whatever they can to move them forward. And, you know, I think it's our responsibility and our goal to help people move forward. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. I've always yeah. found that um, when it comes to Indigenous people, mm-hmm. It's one thing um, where, whatever they are in the world, it's it seems like it's about wiping out indigenous knowledge with them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's this indigenous knowledge where it's so it's so ancient, and it's so it's more pure. It's very it's all it's been passed down orally, you know, as well. So yeah. that type of um, destruction, and also, like I say, I'm, I'm noticing when I was in the Philippines and in, in the meeting the Etta tribe. Mm-hmm. Now, I noticed that they built like a church there because they get them into Christianity. And also, you'll see that in other parts of uh, like where Malaysia is, they're getting them all into Islam. There's still a few there who don't even mix with the, with anyone, though. They, could they say there's about 60% that you see and 40% you don't see. So mm-hmm. it was just amazing. Like, And when I'm having good discussions about them, I'm seeing where their knowledge is at anyway. So yeah. the first time I was in Malaysia, I thought to myself, let me speak to some of these people. The one because there was some that can actually speak English. It, that's one thing about the English language, you might get some people who can speak it, you don't expect yeah. to speak it. You don't so, expect it, yeah. The word of Africa come from Africa. So I was happy that he knew about that. So that was like the one of the main things. And um, mm-hmm. now there's a little story mm-hmm. one about because the first time we did it. When we got there, there was some sort of like tall guy there type thing. Mm-hmm. Now, what he, I had to challenge him. He, he blatantly lied and said to the people, the Dutch people there, Australian people, tallest different people at that time. And he was telling them that they'd only been there for 200 years and he came from Papua New Guinea. Mm-hmm. Wow, when he did this, I had to challenge him in front of that. Mm-hmm. Actually, and because there's no internet, I do think, I think I had our screenshot stuff on my phone. So yeah. I can still get the picture of the show, certain things, and then you go and check the site out later if you want. So sure. I actually ended up after take over, take over, and he was so disappointed. Then he said to me that um, I've got some documents there that can back up what different things. I said okay. So he thought I'm going to forget about it and just go back, but I didn't forget about it. I said, Have you got them documents there? Show me some documents, and he was showing me something completely different. It said basically Pete. Africans that were in Siberia 65 years ago. I was like, yeah. well, why is he showing me this? <laughs> you know, so <laughs> and at the same time, Siberia 65 years ago, they wouldn't look Africoid anyway. So that wouldn't yeah. even be the difference. Well, but you get this done. You know, yeah, what? you got it. And you it's don't really know. Bad. It's really yeah, bad. I can see I can see the challenges, the struggle, and it gets you indignant, yeah. man, when they're telling these lies and you don't know. 
Is it deliberate lies? Are they misrepresenting? Yeah, or are yeah, they yeah. ignorant themselves? Well, this, know, is, this is what if, I do wonder all them questions you've just yeah. said. I, I, is no, he ignorant but, himself or is he told to, is he giving this information? Yeah. Yeah. Is it malicious? Is it meant to deceive? Is it his own ignorance, his own stupidity? You know, because all... a lot of people being brainwashed by the same stuff. Yeah. Could it's already yeah. been verified by scientists, anthropologists, yeah. that these have been yeah. there like 45 mm -hmm. years. You've got the ones yeah. in yeah, well, and... Thailand, or oh, 40,000, 30,000 around them times. Yeah. So... And some of it, some of it, James, as you know, comes back to people don't want to be associated with Africa. Yeah. Because Africans are being vilified. And Africans have been, you know, stereotyped and caricatured. And so, you know, this is what we're up against. But let me say something briefly on, on indigenous knowledge. You know, with indigenous knowledge, it's absolutely crucial. And what you've said, uh, if I understood it, is, you know, uh, Western science rejects indigenous knowledge, but they also appropriate it, right? Yeah. They appropriate the things that they find are useful and interesting, and then they misrepresent it as if it's science. We know a lot of mathematics comes from from um, Arab uh, mathematicians and mathematicians and what's called the, the Middle East. So there's a lot of manipulation going on. And, you know, we, ha we have to continue continue mm -hmm. fighting that. Um, before I get going, tell me what's, your, what's the next thing for you? What's your next priority? Um, I'm trying to reach out uh, to as many conscious people as possible. Basically, yeah. whether I decide to take another trip somewhere. And I, I always do bump into people and I, I find where they need to go. Um, self, self, self. Trying to be self-taught at the same time. Sure, sure. Trying to connect and seeing what I can find, and also, I mean, I like, I'm, I like my zooms. Uh, people like yourself about Robbie. Yeah, it's useful. It's useful. Um, Tata Hanna Rabi from um, South Africa, and he was a he's a very interesting person where he speaks about deep into the spirituality, all yeah. of history, and these are things that are so important. Because one thing about you know, as a professor like yourself. Mm -hmm. You might get some professors who ignore indigenous knowledge, mm -hmm. oral history. It doesn't mean nothing, oral history. But at the same time, I think you've got to keep an open mind on recognizing, obviously, documented history and recognizing yeah. oral history. And sometimes yeah. it can go hand to hand. Sometimes yeah. the way the world is. I'm totally on board with it. I'm totally on board with it. You know, some people say they reject it, some people say it's inferior. But we see many cases where it's superior. So, for example, give you an example, looking at uh, plantations in, in, in Georgia and Louisiana. If you read the documents left by white people, they said, our slaves are happy. Our slaves are Christian. Our slaves were well fed. But when you look at the oral history, you find out that the enslaved people continued African spiritual traditions. Definitely. The African people captured food because the whites wouldn't give them good food. It's a completely different set of insights. Hey, look, I'll follow up with you by email. There's, there's, there's a friend and a colleague in South Africa called uh, Adekije Adebajo, and he's got several books on African thinkers and African philosophies that I think would be very interesting for you. And he's got a new book just came out, actually just came out this week. Uh, so I'll send you some information and I'll talk to him. And if you find it useful, if you want to try and get him on the show, uh, let me know and I'll talk to him. I think he's a good guy. He's doing great work. Mm -hmm. And South Africa, I think, is only one hour difference time zone from yeah, you. In yeah. the UK. So I'll, I'll send it to you. Then, you know, you let me know if you, if you want to continue. It's up to you. Yeah. Look, there's I got to get going. There's also another person you recommended me last time we spoke to one from Ghana. Um, well, is it is it Kwame Namako, the one yeah, I that's it. In? That's yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Okay. People like that, you know, more than welcome to definitely okay. be on, on this show. You know, I love to learn. And it's like you say, it's, it, we've got to connect wherever we are. We're not segregated yeah. to one place. We can only speak to people in the morning. Yeah. You know, we've got to break. Because like, it's like another form of tribalism sometimes like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, it can be, yeah. It can be. Things, that's why things are not just black and white, right? We yeah. We've got people saying, put it behind us or that kind of stuff. You know, the other thing is, let me think about someone in Brazil. Yeah. That uh, if I can that. find someone, you yeah. know, they, they don't all speak English as good. And the ones that do speak English are not always the best. But let me think about that. Right. And, you okay. know, we work towards, towards something like that. Okay, man, look, thanks for the opportunity to share this. I learned from you and I hope I made some contributions. 
Uh, keep up the good work, man. We appreciate it. And I'll go look at your website and look at some of the previous interviews. Uh, thank you very much. This is James the Bone, the Scoveland, dedicated to original peoples. And Professor James Smalls, I really appreciate your time. That was an excellent discussion. And we went a little bit further than where we did last time. But good. It's a pleasure. And, and I appreciate you. And it also gets me thinking, you know, I make some notes about things I got to follow up with. Because I'm humble. I don't, I'm not one of these professors say, look, I know everything. I don't, yeah. I'm learning all the time. Yeah, okay, James, it. take care, man. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, All right. Thank you very much. Sir. See you, man. Bye.